Hi, I'm Brittany Wilmore and welcome to Is It Art Yet? For the next 30 minutes, consider this set the classroom and the show a lesson taught by an instructor in fine arts. Now the saying goes, laughter is the best medicine. According to an article on WebMD, some researchers have found that laughing does pose potential health benefits, such as pain reduction, low blood sugar levels, and even burning calories. But don't ditch your diets just yet. Although we're not exploring the health benefits of laughing, we do want to know how we can make people laugh through comedy. Performers like George Carlin, Richard Pryor, and Carol Burnett are known as comedian pioneers that probably paved the way for a lot of the comedians that we see today. So is being a comedian an art form? Is something funny because it's true and comedians aren't afraid to say it? Drama professor Kathleen Knight from HCC Central and fine arts professor and stand-up comic Jennifer Germany, also from Central, will help us answer those questions. Ladies, thank you for being here. Thank you for having us. Thank you for having us. Now, I know you're ready to bust out with laughter because that's <laughs> all we were doing before mm -hmm. we got on the show. But let's start off with the basics. Let's define comedy. Kathleen? Comedy is so complicated, but it is anything that makes us laugh. And sometimes it's at the expense of others, and sometimes it's at the expense of the comedian mm -hmm. uh, themselves. Um, sometimes it's a situation where it's just ridiculous. Sometimes <laughs> it's a mispronunciation of a word, like a malaprop, which we'll talk about later, or a spoonerism, which is mixing up the, the letters of the first words, like I got my merds mixed up, that kind of thing. And we, we, we laugh at mistakes a lot, which is a very good thing. Well, what I wanted to do was point out some of the devices that are used in comedy. Mm -hmm. You said you have a book and there are more than 50 devices, but yes. for the purpose of the show, we're gonna have to only talk about four or five. Mm -hmm. So let's start with puns. Jennifer? Well, uh, with puns, it's more so of, uh, Kathleen helped me out with explaining it. It's, it's, it's actually using, um, it's like um, there was a fellow just uh, uh, five minutes ago. That, Getting ready to trip. And he, he actually tripped on, uh, on a uh, thing, in the, holding the, the door. And I said, oh, do you have a nice trip? They used that on me in sixth grade. Yeah. <laughs> because I was always walking over myself and I was like, yeah, yeah I'll yeah. see you next fall. Yeah, that's just right. trying to play it's it off. It's almost like pointing point. out a flaw or accident and making light of it in a humorous way. Because actually, it, it helps to ease the situation. Nobody wants to be the butt of the joke, but you have to acknowledge it just happened. You almost tripped. You didn't, I'm glad, but it was still funny. So, puns is just pretty much uh, highlighting the flaw that just happened in a humorous light. Well, the next one, and you mentioned it a little earlier, a few seconds ago, actually, spoonerism. What yeah. is that? Because I'm spoonerism hearing a spooner. Spoonerism was so. made, named after a person mm -hmm. named Spooner. Wasn't it Spooner? Spooner. Somebody uh, named Spooner. spooner. We'll yeah. call him William. It'll work. <laughs> yeah, that's better, yeah. Mm -hmm. William Spooner. And um, uh, you, you just switch the letters around. And so, like, I get my merds mixed up, or it can be any kind, of, you can make spoonerisms out of. Like I accidentally on stage said, I meant to say menopause, but I was in such, on such a roll, I said menopause. And everybody just fell out laughing. They were like, you're a teacher and you just mispronounced menopause. And so I just kept it in the joke and it actually still works. So I love saying menopause. I hope when my mom watching this, she won't be offended. <laughs> Well, let's go on to parody and satire, and these are things that we see a lot of with your, you know, your daily shows. And Saturday Night Live, exactly. constantly. My, yeah. The best examples of satire was the 2008 presidential election. Saturday Night Live was my political update because they made fun of all the news that came out on that week when they did the rap with Sarah Palin and, and the debate between Perfect. Sarah Palin yes. and um, Hillary so Clinton. Funny. I, the characters were so well-rounded and so diverse, you couldn't help but to laugh. And it made you actually want to watch the news to find out, okay, what's the real skinny on what's going on? So, mm -hmm. Well, see, that's how I've always felt. When I watch shows like that, I almost feel like I have to follow the news or else I won't get it. Yes, yes. Sometimes because it's, it's taking the event and, and doing it in a very funny way, but, but it has realism with it. Otherwise, like you said, it wouldn't work. Exactly, and, and there's some styles of comedy, like the Seinfeld type of comedy. You have to be abreast of what's going on, because really, I watch the news, and there are some funny things that actually happen in the news, whether it's local, national, or abroad. There are some funny things that, you, that are funny, but you have to be abreast to catch it, or to go, 
And as a comedian, the first thing we always say is, that went over your head. When you watch the news later, you'll get it later. And I've actually had people to come back, oh, I read that, that was funny. Okay, you got it four days later, but you have to be abreast. Well, you mentioned the word realism, Kathleen, and that leads into slice of life. So how do we use that with comedy? Slice of life is probably used a lot more now than it used to be. And we were just talking in the, in the dressing room that a lot of our current shows are really about a slice of life. And the writers may have taken their own experience, which has, that is real, and then people can relate to that a lot. Would you like to elaborate on that? Uh, a couple of examples of that is Everybody Loves Raymond. That's a satire, that's a cold comedy piece about his life. And before getting uh, onto the air, that's the material he was doing in stand-up. When we look at Bernie Mac and how he had to take in his nieces and nephews due to his sister being addicted to drugs, the fact that the day-to-day -day life of raising these kids and how they turned his life inside out was funny. And then everybody can identify with that. And I think the one thing comedy does is bring everybody together. Yes. And everybody can identify with what's going on. Uh, one of the, the jokes I do is talking about weight loss and how women, we are insecure about our weight. Like, I'm looking at this camera going, Am I, let me get my skinny side. <laughs> what's that? And I wanted it's to talk like this. Right? But that's something that many and women will relate to. And yeah. it's funny. Yeah. And men can identify with that as well because they've all been asked the infamous question, am I fat? Well, hopefully they <laughs> have the right answer for that one. Mm -hmm. And by the way, you doing all of that is something that we'll get to see more of your personality from in the second segment. After the break, Jennifer takes the mic to give us a lesson in stand-up. Stay tuned. All right, give me a spot. You know my motto, safety first. They could be dangerous. I think we should call animal control. Animal control? To be safe. Don't worry. Just... I got this. It's a new motto. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. There are thousands of teens in foster care who don't need perfection. They need you. Welcome back to Is It Art Yet? Before the break, we define comedy, the different types and devices used to make it happen. It's time to see it in action through the world of stand-up. So you are a stand-up comedian. In addition to being a professor, you do that on the side. What's it like being a stand-up comedian? It is very relaxing. It, it's an avenue of creativity. And it's a way of getting on your soapbox and just letting it all hang out. And a lot of times out of 10, people agree with letting it all hang out. So it's awesome. Well, let's talk about some of the elements of being uh, stand-up comic. Is there a timing involved? Uh, let me tell you, timing is everything. You can ruin a joke if you don't set it up correctly and you come in too fast or if you draw it out too, uh, too long. So you have to hit it just right. It's kind of like, and then knowing your audience, you have to know when to set it up, uh, create it, and go in for the kill because uh, timing can kill the whole joke. Well, let's talk about the audience. How do you interact with them? Do they give you feedback in any kind of way to make you know which direction to go? How does the audience play a role? Well, first of all, when you are the entertainer, you are the leader of the show. It's already established that the audience is there to laugh and they're ready for you. So it's up to you to come out and let it all hang out. And generally, if you come into the stage environment and you take leadership role, the audience will follow you. And also, the audience will tell you if you hit or miss out a joke, but then that's when recovery comes in. If you see a joke getting work, you kind of play off of it, and then you transition into the next one. You never just hold up in the moment if a joke doesn't go well, because the audience is like, okay, that wasn't funny, let's go on to the next, we're ready to laugh again. So it's all about transition at that point. And the audience can tell definitely when you're hanging on, when you're fishing for it. The audience can smell fear, they can smell when you are not comfortable, and they can tell when you don't believe in your material. That's why I always say when you're doing material, do something that's believable to you, something that's real to you, even if you have to exaggerate it. Make sure it's something that you can connect with because the audience can tell if you're giving them a bit of fakery. And, and that, was, that was my next question because we talked a little bit about the slice of life. Mm -hmm. But let's say 
I don't know, maybe you couldn't find the funny in something that realistically happened to you. If you're a great storyteller, can you fib a little bit or can you they smell that too? Because a lot of times with comedy, it's an exaggeration. You add to it. It may be funny in a beginning type sense, in a premise sense, but when you add that exaggeration, it's just like a good movie, a good love story. You can't just start off with, you know, Bill met Jane and they fell in love. Who's gonna watch it? But when you say Bill made eye contact with Jane and he was so in love and this, people are gonna drool. <gasps> Give me more. So adding to that works. And I like a lot of movies with a lot of exaggeration in it. <laughs> okay, well, say someone's exaggerating too much and it's time for them to pass the mic. How do they know when they need to get off the stage? Uh, the audience will boo. That's when boo! Get off stage and tomatoes are thrown. Uh, <laughs> but generally, you can get a feel. If the audience is tired or if they're tired of you talking about a certain subject or they're ready to move on, by their nonverbals, you'll see the switching of the seats, the eyes, or the watching of the time, or the comedy club owner will go, get off, that's enough. So you can tell, the audience will let you know. Are there any rules, so to speak, a formula when it comes to being a stand-up comic? Anything that you kind of do want to break or you don't? Uh, one of the rules is, again, going back to timing. Always respect the stage. And when I say respect the stage, if you're given a certain amount of time, always adhere to that amount of time. I, I remember when I did the, had the opportunity, rather, to open up for the Bad Boys of Comedy at the Verizon Theater. Uh, one of the things, when I won the contest to do it, and I got up there to see, you have 15 minutes, get on, get off. But I already knew, as being a speech instructor, if you're given 15 minutes, you prepare for 14 minutes and some change. You never time it for exactly 15 because you never know if you may uh, stumble or get caught up in the moment. And one thing I did when I got up, I got off in like 14 minutes and 15 seconds, and he was like, I can work for you. Why? He said, you respect the fact that this is a business, this is about time, and this is about the fluency of the show. So you always want to... Um, adhere to the rules and also to make sure that you adhere to the rules. The comedy club owner, for a lot of you who think that we just automatically know when to get off stage, no, we cheat. There is a red light above your head that you can't see that'll flash and let you know that you're at your minute mark or two minute mark. And then when it's flashing, that means get off immediately. So that's a, a cheating technique, but um, just respecting the time and just being prepared when you go up. Well, you also teach being a stand-up comic. So how do you teach somebody to do this? Are there people that just aren't funny or don't have it? I mean, how do you tell you someone how to do this? Actually, there are some people who are better writers of comedy than they are uh, getting on stage and doing it themselves. Because getting on stage and actually presenting, that's a whole nother formula in and of itself. And that's where the acting classes from Miss Kathleen come into play. We're learning how to work the stage and getting into character. And there are a lot, a lot of the comedians you see professionally have writers behind the stage that, hey, I can write, but I'm not getting up there and doing it. But when I teach it, I'll tell there's different aspects of comedy you can get into from the writing side uh, to the actual performance side. But one of the first things you have to have a sense of self. Uh, you have to be under, uh, understanding to the fact that in order to get in front of any audience, you have to be able to laugh at yourself. You cannot be shy because when your audience, they're looking at you, they're looking at all, at all your perfections and your imperfections and you have to be able to make fun of them. I remember one time I made a joke because I had gained so much weight and I said a joke about doing a magic trick and I said, you know what, if I can make this come up to here, I can have bigger breasts and less stomach and, and, and people were like, fell out laughing because I was okay. Look, I have a huge beer belly, unfortunately, but it's okay. And, and the fact that I broke that ice with cracking jokes on myself, uh, it made them feel more relaxed. And plus, I, I would say you're addressing it before someone else does. Calls it out. So if you're comfortable with it, it makes them comfortable. It's comfortable with, and it makes them also feel comfortable in their own skin. Well, she can acknowledge her flaws. Well, I'm okay if I have a third eye right here and a unibrow right here, and I'm dating this guy I really don't want to be with. I'm just here for free drinks. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> You are ready to crack me up more, yes. I know it, and that's why you're going to do a routine uh, right now. Why don't you tell me a little bit about what we're about to hear? Well, what you're about to hear is a true story, somewhat, with exaggeration, about my first experience with teaching and how I almost lost my first job. It wasn't quite, but it could have gone this route uh, with this particular student, so it was very interesting how I had to handle it. Okay, I want to hear how you did this, so I'm going to let you have the mic. Okay. All right, look, this is a true life story. It happened to me, so please don't judge me because everybody can make mistakes. Uh, I just graduated from college. I was excited. I was still living at home with my mom and dad, and they gave me the bad news. You need to get a job. 
And so I was searching and searching, and the only people that was hiring was the educational system. They didn't require too much of a background check or anything. They didn't care how many speeding tickets you got or how many times you had to sit tickets out. They didn't care. So I started this teaching job, and I was excited about teaching. I'm like, I get to touch young minds. Yes, I came in with my Louis Vuitton purse and my cell phone, and I was ready to work it. <sighs> until I almost got fired like 30 minutes later. So I walked into a classroom and this kid walked up to me. Now mind you, I'm about four feet <clears throat> and some change. I didn't know that kids were this huge, right? They say Milky does the body good, but apparently these kids were getting it straight from the cow because this kid was like, I'm here, he's way up there. So I'm walking in and I'm sashaying and doing my thing and then the kid walks up to me, all gangsta and was like, Miss Germany, I'm going to kick yo. I said, oh, did this kid just threaten me? Now, let me give you a little background on myself. I'm from the hood. I'm off a of homestead tent. Well, what it is, yeah. I had to remember I couldn't do that with these kids, but I slipped back into my zone. I said, excuse me, young man, what did you say? He said, you heard me. I said, I'm going to kick yo. And then all of a sudden, I was like, oh, my God, what do I do next? What do I do next? What do I do next? And then the little boy got eye to eye with me. And of course, his eye was right here. My eye was down there. So I climbed in a chair. I said, what would I do if I was on the strip on Homestead and Tickwell? What would I do? So I climbed up in this chair. I looked that kid eye to eye. I said, wait a minute. You don't know who you are messing with. I looked that kid in the eye. I said, what, what, what? Wham! Laid him out. And then all of a sudden, I started hearing my theme song. We are the champions, my friends. And I looked at the rest of the class, and I said, the next third grader talk noise to me, this will be you. And then all of a sudden, the principal walked in, and she's like, Miss Germany, what happened? Oh, my God. I said, well, I was following your directions. I said, you told me to love them, nurture them, and educate them, and to raise them the same way my mother raised me. She said, yes. I said, so I beat the hell out of everybody. Now we're A-OK -okay in this classroom. And then that's when they sent me walking with some paperwork and some things of that nature. But I'm good now. Now I'm here at HCC. <laughs> you can do whatever you like. Yeah. <laughs> we are different. Society should aspire to be more like us. Be part of the first class. Get energized. Get outside. Hold on, guys. It's gonna get bumpy. And get moving. Experience the power of physical activity. Woo! <laughs> Join the movement at actionheroalliance.com. HCC students Eduardo Lopez and Cameron Tahirpour are going to perform a scene called The Actors. Cameron, set us up. What is the scene about? Yeah, we play um, two actors. We're in a casting office and uh, we happen to be auditioning for the same role. And um, we start arguing uh, about what met acting methods are better and kind of spirals into chaos from there. Yeah. Chaos always sounds like fun. Oh, it's always fun. So, let's see it. Excuse me. My contemplative silence isn't bothering you, is it? I'm sorry, are you talking to me? Keen grasp of the obvious you got there. Yes, I'm talking to you. Well, what can I do for you? Well, you're um, humming, or I assume this humming is interrupting me. Sorry. I'll be quiet. Thank you. My pleasure. So, what are you preparing for? Well, being that I'm in a casting office, my first guess would be an audition. Oh, well, looks like we're doing the same part then. Yeah, and that's nice for us, huh? 
I suppose that sparks feelings of kinship for you? No, 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 no. I'm just making small talk, that's it. Um, please don't. I, I'm trying to prepare, and I need to center myself. No, look, I understand. Please go right ahead. Forget that I'm here, okay? From your mouth. Uh -huh. So what are you doing? I'm, I'm trying to concentrate. I was just, okay, look. I was just focusing on what you were doing right now and earlier because, you know, I never seen nobody done that ever before. So I'm just trying to be sure that you're doing something right. What, that I'm not moving, that I'm staying still? I, I mean, of course, I, I'm, I'm centering myself. I'm not going to move when I'm centering myself. It's not physical, it's internal. And where did you learn that? Uda. Who's Uda? Uda? You, so, um, you haven't... You, she's one of the greatest acting teachers that ever lived. You've never heard of Uda Hagen? No, uh, I, I, I'm thinking it's one of those religious European things, you know that? No. What, 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 what are you talking, philosophy? What, this is acting. You, you're bringing a whole different world here. Look. I mean, how, how, how long have you been acting, man? A little over a year, guys. <laughs> wow. Yeah. And you're here? Yeah, apparently. My first year of acting, I was... I wasn't allowed to audition. I wasn't even allowed to talk. Why? Because, um, I mean, until I could understand my craft, until I could create a character, what I had to say as an actor was irrelevant. What is that? It's just, just the way it is. I mean, Stella taught me that. S Stella? Let me guess. <laughs> Who the sister, right? <laughs> Okay, where exactly did you study acting? No, no, no. What's the study? All you have to do is you have a script. You say what it needs to be said, and that's it. <laughs> yeah, straightforward like that. It would seem so. Would you, would you like to see how it's done professionally? Okay, go right ahead. Sounds like fun. <laughs> fun? Yeah, sounds like fun. Fun? <laughs> acting? It is not fun. It's an art. And art is suffering. It's digging down into the depths of your soul in despair. It's reaching down your innermost secret part of yourself, wrenching it out for the whole world to see it. Just trample on. The one thing acting is not is fun. Do you understand? All right, all right, all right. I understand. I understand. Boy. You take this acting stuff seriously, don't you? Do you want to see how it's done? Do you want to do it? Okay, sure, why not? Okay, stand up. Oh. Come on. Close your eyes. Why? Because if you can see the outer world, you're connected to it. If you I mean, if you're connected to the outer world, you're not connected to your inner self. Make sense? All right. Well, might as well. All right. Yeah. Now spread your arms wide. Now I want... No, don't say anything. Just, just please, just listen. All right, all right, all right. I want you to let your legs become one with the floor. I want your body one with the air. And your head one with the universe. Don't you think you're spreading me a little too thin here? What? I mean, come on. You want my head to be on top of the air, my arms to be reaching out, and then my legs are on the floor, and I mean, I don't understand about this universe. No, 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 and no, no, okay, you're missing the point. This is to free you up so you can dive into the character and rip its heart out. What if I don't want to rip its heart out? Huh? <laughs> I mean, then you're not going to learn much from the character. How could you portray him if you don't know the character? <laughs> Are you serious? This is a dog food commercial. All you have to do is understand that the person has a dog, Rex, who likes Mr. Chin Wu Chan Chinese dog food. I mean... No, no. See, this is my point, and Uta's. 
if this is all you're gonna gonna learn from, I mean, you're not gonna. That's just the surface. If you if you don't explore more than that, how do you expect to get a job? Oh, I've gotten jobs, several commercials. Yeah. <laughs> how many commercials could you have possibly gotten? <laughs> Seriously? Yeah. Last year, fourteen. Fourteen? Yeah. <laughs> What were they, um, some uh, local things? No, uh, they were all nationals. I uh, forgot what my agent called it. Wait, wait, you did Nash? Those were nationals? Yeah. Just you, did, you did 14 national commercials? Yeah, four, there it goes, 14 national commercials. Last year? Mm -hmm. And then last year, at that time, I had done five. Yeah, five. Wow. Well, um, I mean, uh, and they were fun too. I mean, I made a down payment on a full house and a car. Well, that's, well, that's good. But um, if you don't, uh, if you don't learn more, I don't expect that to last too long. What do you mean? I mean, you know, I mean, fourteen commercials. I can't. It's, it's like a one-time thing, you know. Look. I know they were fun and all, but something that I've done. So you, you've done how many commercials this year already? I've done three. It is, it's only February. Right? Yeah, I know. You did three in a month? Yeah, and I've done, I said I've done 14. Okay. Yeah. So, um, what do you, uh, <laughs> what do you exactly do when you audition? <laughs> Wait a minute, wait a minute. What about Stella and Nuda? <laughs> Forget them. All right. Wait, 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 wait. But I thought they were important to you. I thought they were the best. <laughs> I thought so, but I mean, did they ever do 14 national commercials in a year? Uh, you bet they didn't, so tell me. All right, look, you see here. I went up to auditions and I did some chimichanga. Chimichanga? What is that, Chinese? Chinese? <laughs> Cameron, you were a little emotional there. Oh, yeah. You seemed a little broken up that Eduardo here at 14 National Commercials. Well, yeah, because, you know, here I thought I was doing, doing the right things, and uh, apparently not. This guy, uh, more easygoing, getting more work, of course. Who wouldn't be sad and emotional? <laughs> well, I think you guys did do the right things. You did a great job. We were all laughing over behind the shadows there. So um, you actually learned some of this, I'm guessing, in Kathleen's comedy class that you took in the spring. So mm -hmm. talk to me about being in that class. Yeah, um, it was an amazing, fun class. I mean, you taking that class, you learn um, how to detect comedy. You learn that comedy exists everywhere, every single day. And all your life, you don't see it because you're not aware of it. And with Kathleen, you start you start detecting it all the time. You hear something and you find a comedy um, of it. And you know, um, we always had to bring a joke in class, so she's bringing the comedy out of us. And everyone can be comedic. You know, some people will say they're not, but it's just finding it in yourself and, and uh, her class helps with that. Yeah. Thank you. Well, you both here are instructors. Kathleen told me you guest instructed one time yes, in that class, so yes. give me some, as professors, we finally have you here with students. Mm -hmm. Give me some feedback on that performance. I enjoyed it. Um, watching, especially they just took the class last spring and have them to start from as beginners and to progress to this point. Uh, we made comments how we got off script, but they kept going because in theater and even in comedy, you have to fake it until you make it because a lot of times the scripts sometimes get thrown out the window, but you have to keep going and I think they did a phenomenal job. All right, well we have about 30 seconds. Kathleen, is there any last information that you want to say about this class that you have for the fall? Well, I'm going to uh, present this one more time and it, this was such fun that I want to encourage people to come and experience it for themselves um, and to learn there are 50 comedic uh, devices. Right, and we have the information right there. It's Acting 2, Drama 1352, the comedy class by Kathleen Knight. Kathleen.knight at hccs.edu if you want to get more information or the phone number 713-718-6600. So I want to thank all of you guys for being here today and thank you for watching Is It Art Yet? We'll see you next time. Yeah.